Over the last few months, I have been very vocal about the changes that happened at this year's annual meeting and how they could fundamentally change how Jehovah's Witnesses even live their lives and how they perceive themselves. It even gets ZZ excited. But with all that being said, we finally have our first glimpse of the printed version of a watchtower, and this is via a leak that came out on Reddit. So let's do this. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the JW Thoughts channel. My name is Wally and today we are looking at this leaked uh, watchtower. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the entire thing. I wasn't able to get my hands on it, but that's okay. We'll work with the information that we have currently. And I find it kind of interesting uh, how they talk about this because it's some of the points that I brought up as sort of a counter to the narrative that they were mentioning. Quickly, before we get into it, don't forget to drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps it get out to more people on YouTube. With all of that being said, let's do this. So as we can see here, this is the May 2024 Watchtower, which will be discussed sometime between July 8th and August 11th. So a little bit down the road, but as we know, they print and make these Watchtowers like six, eight months in advance. So, and they plan them even farther out in advance. But let's get a little glimpse of what this has to say. Now, again, I don't have the entire article, but I'll show you what was actually leaked. So starting here with this section on what we do not know. In the past, our publications have considered the question of what happens to those whom Jehovah judges as unrighteous. We have said that for such individuals as those in Sodom and Gomorrah, there is no hope of a future resurrection. But further prayerful study has raised the question, can we really say that with certainty? Consider a number of related questions. Several Bible accounts describe Jehovah's judgments against unrighteous people, such as the unknown numbers who died in the flood or the seven nations in the promised land that Jehovah ordered his people to devote to destruction or the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers slain by an angel of Jehovah in a single night. In these cases, does the Bible give us enough information to, ter to determine that Jehovah sentenced all those individuals to eternal destruction with no hope of a resurrection? No, it does not. Why can we say that? We do not know how Jehovah judged each individual, nor do we know whether those who were killed had an opportunity to learn about Jehovah and to repent. In regard to the time of the flood, the Bible does say that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, this is where it gets a little confusing, because are the governing body coming out and basically playing God? Are they putting on their Jesus cap and saying, we know more than God? Because the Bible clearly says that these people were judged, and as punishment for their judgment was death. So, why would God kill people if he wasn't sure if they were in a position to find repentance? Why would he just off them like that? Wouldn't it have been more, like, why, why torture people, I guess is what I'm saying. Like, imagine a, a, a parent, and they are punishing their child. They, like, one kid comes and says, hey, he stole my cookies. And you say, oh, well, I'm just, no questions asked. You just grab their hand and put it on a stove and hold it there for 30 seconds. And then say, ah, now you learned your lesson. Then to come find out later, they didn't actually steal the cookie. Would you look at that father and say, you were, a re you were justified in meeting out this horrific punishment for something that someone didn't deserve? What would you think of a parent that did that? And this is a, a step above that because it's death. And sure, yes, you can say the, oh, well, he can resurrect them in the future. But going through the experience of drowning is one of the worst human experiences you could possibly have. So why, why would God do that if we're going to look at God as this loving parent? 
But it does not say that while he was building a colossal ark, he was also attempting to reach every individual on earth who would face destruction in the deluge. Similarly, in the case of the nations of Canaan, we do not know if all those wicked people had an opportunity to learn about Jehovah and change their ways. What of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? A righteous man named Lot lived in their midst. But do we know that Lot preached to all of them? No. They were certainly wicked, but did they all know any better? Recall that a crowd of men in the city sought to uh, our word Lot's guess. The Bible says that the mob ranged from boy to old man. Do we really know the merciful God, that the merciful God, Jehovah, condemned each one to death with no hope of resurrection? Jehovah assured Abraham that there was not even ten righteous men in the city. So they were unrighteous, and Jehovah justly held them accountable for their actions. Can we say for certain, then, that none of them will rise in the resurrection of the unrighteous? No, we cannot say for sure. So this is something that I brought up in the last video I made about this, is they, the question was asked. Abraham was like, well, if there's 100, if there's 50, if there's 10... Will you save them? And he's like, yes, of course. I will spare the city, the entire city, if there's even 10 righteous people. But when the judgment was made, there wasn't. So God assessed the situation, read the room, and said, unfortunately, you guys are a bunch of devious vagabonds that need to be blasted with fireballs. And so he blasted them with fireballs. Even the sons-in-law of Lot, they kind of let, when the angels came and said, you need to get out of the city, in the Bible it says, oh, they thought it was kind of a joke. So they were even blasted. It's an incredible amount of hubris for the leaders of Watchtower to look at these scriptures where it clearly says that God made a judgment call and then to call into question the validity of that call that he made. If he looked upon the entire earth in Noah's day and saw that no one was righteous except for Noah and his family, so he drowned everyone, who are they to say that, well, maybe there were some people? Now, that question is, is relevant because a big criticism that Watchtower gets is, hey, what about kids? What about you know, these people in this faraway land and country, like how could they have possibly known anything about God? So you have a predicament here and Watchtower is trying to weasel their way out of their predicament, but it makes their God inconsistent. And that is the real problem that they're coming to. So this is sort of how they're talking about the buildup to this other mass murder situation that's going to happen. So we had these mass murder situations and Watchtower is basically trying to say, well, maybe some of those people that were killed by fireballs and by drowning, maybe God made a little bit of an oopsie here and there. Maybe he didn't mean to blow that person up with a fireball raining down from heaven. Maybe it was like, oh man, missed my target. Golly gee willikers. Wish I wish I had better aim. And they're trying to use that to talk about the future and how they have talked about Armageddon. So let's get into that part of this article. Now, jumping forward over here to paragraph 12. Again, I'll do a full breakdown of this article when it's released in full, but uh, working with what we got now. Uh, so paragraph 12, even after the Great Tribulation starts, it is possible that some who see the destruction of Babylon the Great will recall that Jehovah's Witnesses had long, long spoken about this event. Might some who see these events have a change of heart? Such an outcome would be similar to what occurred in Egypt in Moses' day. Recall that a vast mixed company joined Israel in the Exodus. Some of these individuals may have started to develop faith when they saw that Moses' warnings about the ten plagues came, and I'm assuming the sentence ends in true, so this is a direct statement from Watchtower saying it will be possible for people to wait for evidence, just like it will be possible for people to wait for me to drink some water so my voice doesn't sound like a frog. 
Now, why is this significant? Well, this means that you do not have to be a believing Jehovah's Witness without evidence. You can literally take a back seat and wait until there is proof of a claim that the Jehovah's Witnesses made has come true. What is that claim? That the entire world governments are going to turn on all the religions of the world. Yes, that is that is what this great tribulation is. So whether you live in Syria or Burma or Afghanistan or America or France or Iceland, it doesn't matter. All of the governments of the world are going to come to a unified agreement and put a permanent ban on all religion. That would be something that I cannot close my eyes currently and see happening for the next 200 or so years, maybe even longer. I, I just, when I think about it, I don't see it happening. But if that did happen, it would be a prediction that if it happened here in the next like 20 years, it would be a prediction that the Jehovah's Witnesses somehow got right. Would it prove everything? No, obviously not. That's not how these things work, but it would be a sign, some sign of evidence. So if people did want to say, oh, well, it looks like the great tribulation has started. They've banned all religion. I think now it's time to be like one of those Egyptians that after they saw the 10 plagues and they saw those things come true, they might've thought to themselves, hmm, yeah, maybe we want to start, uh, you know, supporting these guys because something's happening here. There's evidence. We don't know what it is, but maybe we'll just support them just to hedge our bets a little bit. So I think that this is a fascinating change because one of the biggest fears that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have and ex-Jehovah's Witnesses have is that what if they're right? So some people don't leave the Jehovah's Witnesses for necessarily good reasons. It's not because of their philosophic fallacies, their scriptural sins, their scientific sign-offs, their historical hiccups. I don't know why I'm being so alliterative. But some people leave just because it doesn't feel right and they want to just live a normal life of quote-unquote sin. And because of that, they live with this incredible weight because I, I talk to these people all the time. They believe that at any moment, the great tribulation could break out and it would be too late for them because that's what they've always been told. It would be too late for them to return to Jehovah. They would just be killed. Now they don't have to live with that weight anymore because if they want to leave and live in what their normal life, then they could see the evidence, just like the Egyptians saw the evidence of the ten plagues, allegedly, and come back and support the organization once again. So it eliminates all of that fear, and it also eliminates the fear of leaving, because one thing that is super terrifying, as an example, would be when it comes to blood transfusions. Some people would never get a blood transfusion because... The Great Tribulation could break out tomorrow, and they would be cut off, and they wouldn't get the paradise. Now, that same person that's contemplating having their life saved by getting a blood transfusion, are they going to think to themselves, well, I can still wait till there's evidence that all of these things are true, and I can still come back? Maybe I'll just save my life. Sounds pretty good to me. So it's it's a massive fundamental change that's happened. Now, I do want to talk about one other thing, and uh, I guess I have to do these qualifiers here because we have this baffling phenomenon that exists within the community where if you disagree with someone, somehow it's seen as an attack or like you're causing or stirring up drama when in the real world, that's 
not the case. If if someone asks me, oh, what's your favorite food? And I say, oh, Vietnamese and French. What's your favorite food? Oh, Italian and Mexican. Oh, I can't believe you would attack me by saying that your favorite food isn't Vietnamese and French. It's just, it's it doesn't, I've never seen it exist anywhere else. But uh, I, I don't think it's healthy because if we have that mentality where there is no critique and there's no criticism, uh, it gets a little culty criticism critique culty see we're still being alliterative so hey we're we're banging on all cylinders but um someone emailed me a a clip uh from lloyd evans and his uh, rebuttal to the annual meeting and i found the and i i'll be completely honest i didn't watch the entirety of his video it was over an hour long but i did see the clip that someone sent me but it doesn't seem like it's out of context it seems pretty straightforward anyway i just wanted to talk about it because i think it's kind of a bad take and i just kind of disagreed with it so anyway let's uh look at what he was saying about the annual meeting and hopefully people don't act the most and think that i'm trying to cause drama I just think it's an interesting talking point. For the record, you can disagree with me, and that's okay. You can disagree with him, that's okay. You can disagree with both of us, and that's okay. You are allowed to have your own positions on whatever you want, you know? I, I'm not the police here. You don't have to like me. You don't have to agree with me. It's all good across the board. But I did think it was at least an interesting talking point because it was a... Uh, a, a perception of this new light that was diametrically opposed to sort of how I was looking at it. So hopefully at least it leads to some interesting conversation. So we've been listening to Jeffrey Jackson speaking at the 2023 annual meeting, and I'm going to be completely honest because I've heard people jumping up and down about this talk in particular. and the new light about the Great Tribulation. I really don't see a huge deal here. I think that Jeffrey Jackson is using lots of words and indeed a timeline. <laughs> and indeed a timeline to describe not very much of anything at all. Does it really make a huge difference whether people are condemned to death at Armageddon, at Armageddon, or shortly before Armageddon? I would argue it makes no difference whatsoever. I would argue that is hair-splitting. So, I just don't quite understand this take, because... I'll, I'll try and illustrate how Watchtower ha was in the past and how they are now. So... Before they were a health guru dietitian, or we're just cooking off the top of our head, and they gave you a a calendar uh, that was your meal plan, and they said you can never have bread, zero bread, January to December, nothing, no bread whatsoever. Then they come back to you and they say, actually, you can have bread all the way up until December. And then you have to stop having bread. And you'll get the same result. Those two things, that's not hair splitting. Those two things are fundamentally different. You can now not be a Jehovah's Witness until there's evidence here at the end, when, when things become readily apparent. Whereas before, you had to always believe, all the time, no matter what. Like the dietitian says, hey, if you if you eat one ounce of bread, if you have one little crouton, I'm going to come to your house and beat you up. <laughs> you know, you, you'll die if you have that. And now you won't die all the way up until December. So it just seems like a bizarre take to me. But I was just really curious because when, uh, when someone sent this to me and I saw it, I was like, well, maybe I'm the dum-dum here in this situation and I don't 
maybe I'm missing something. So comment down below if I'm not seeing this clearly, because to me, it seems like a fundamental shift, like it changes everything about being a Jehovah's Witness. So anyway, with all of that being said, uh, if you're still around, don't forget to drop a like on the video, subscribe to the channel uh, for further updates uh, about what's going on in Jehovah's Witness land. Uh, yeah, let's do, what's the outro? Stay safe, be kind, and don't forget to show yourself the same kindness that you show to others. I wonder how hard I'm going to get flamed for just disagreeing with Lloyd Evans. Well, either way, I'm still going to have a good-ass day. And I think this is a really good example of the governing body trying to send us all up a blind alley by making something sound more interesting and more exciting than it really is.